Awesome. Well, I think we can get started, Kathleen, do you think, um, just to, to go through and then uh, people can trickle in. I think some people are usually a few minutes late. Um, so Yo is joining. So great, welcome everyone. Thank you for being here. Um, my name is Tu, I'm part of the Taylor Rue Collective. Um, and today we have Kathleen Hicks, uh, who's a AR VR designer <laughs> from uh, Digital Precept. And um, she, she's here to, to tell us everything about um, AR VR tools and what she's been up to. Very excited to have her. Um, Thanks for being here, Sandy. So, uh, so a little bit about us as well as a Taylor Collective. Uh, I'll drop a link in the chat after. We are a group of um, researcher designers who work on humanity-driven projects together. So a lot of sustainability, um, game and play, which is very apt for the AR VR conversation. Um, and um, you know, arts craft. We we work on projects together. We go out and support kind of startups and in the impact space together. So yeah, overall a pretty cool group of people. And this uh, this kind of workshop, uh, Kathleen is gracious enough to lend her expertise to us, and so we're excited to bring her knowledge to you all. Um, I'm gonna hand over to Kathleen to uh, to do her thing. Hello everyone, and thanks for coming out. Um, again, yeah, Catherine Hicks, ARVR designer in short, kind of say, I'm really like a 3D generalist, but I've used the title ARVR designer, um, but I guess I can share my screen and get started. Uh, oh, cool, optimize for sound. All right, let me play this. Da, da, da. It loads. There you go. Can everyone see the screen? Just gonna see if I can. All right. All right. So, practice of AR VR design. And I'm, I'll go and show some of the work I've done, just like a demo reel. Whoops. Let's see. So this is kind of a little bit of what I've done in the past. some more work i did a last year i did a snapchat uh, black history month filter for snapchat and uh currently i'm working on uh, a, a vr asymmetric co-op uh game called mend uh which was a 2019 oculus launchpad grant recipient so you play as like two sisters and one person would be the PC, traditional pc player the other person would be the vr player who's the owl like character uh, and then I did like a, I was part of a Snapchat storytelling re residency and did like a cryptozoology AR um, a 3D model. So yeah, uh, some of the software I that I would recommend using if you're interested in getting into more of like, I guess, AR VR design or in some cases like, th like a 3D generalist working in AR VR design would be 
uh, software packages like Blender, Cinema 4D, Maya. ZBrush is like a more sculptural tool used for like organics and character modeling, but it's still like they're all those programs are great. Blender is amazing. I'm still surprised it's free software. Um, Lend, in terms of game engines or XR engines, Lens Studio is Snapchat's AR software. Spark AR is uh, Meta's AR software. Um, Meta used to be called Facebook, just in case. So, but yeah, now it's Meta. Uh, Unity and Unreal are both game engines. Um, and for VR sculpting and painting, Adobe Medium it used to be called Oculus Medium, but Adobe acquired it. Now it's Adobe Medium, Tilt Brush, Gravity Sketch, an Oculus Quill, which is more of like kind of VR painting. And Gravity Sketch has, I've seen being used for a lot for like uh, different like design, almost like shoe design and material design and car design, but it has multi-purpose things as well as like all these VR sculpting slash painting tools. And in terms of like texturing mater slash materials or creating like, for example, this tentacle thing, I, it was adding textures to it. I'd use like Substance 3D, which there's Substance Painter, Designer, and then there's a bunch of other Substance software, um, which is also acquired by Adobe. Um, so those are, that's the software I'd recommend. And I'm just going to show like a, a short little breakdown thing or process of a, of a lens, a Snapchat AR filter I made using Lens Studio. Um, so this is more of like the inspiration behind the lens. I'm a big nerd and I like playing tabletop role-playing games. And one of the games I like to play is called Cthulhu. So I was heavily inspired by Cthulhu and the tabletop role-playing game called Call Cthulhu by Sandy Peterson. And this is kind of like an inspiration board, mini board had for it. And how this lens works is it, it can be scaled and rotated in your space. Uh, and it kind of just has this moving animation where the tentacle kind of goes back and forth. Um, but the software I used was, I use ZBrush and Blender. I kind of did a block modeling process uh, within Blender, then I sent it over to ZBrush and did more of like, I guess a fine tuning sculptural process with the tentacle. And then I went back and rigged it in Blender, which means adding a skeleton or armature to that model so it can move and animate and as well as animated in Blender. Then I took it into Substance Painter. I uh, added texture, like painted in textures, like textural elements into it. And then I took that model, which has now been textured, animated and rigged into Lens Studio and created a cool little shader, which if you don't know, the shader is like this little, oh, I don't, my finger <laughs> that was little like glowing element at the bottom and created that in one studio and this is like a node system it's basically the components that make this cool effect um but that's kind of like a very small <laughs> breakdown of like how i made this filter um but i highly recommend like if you're interested in especially like ar lens studio is amazing and has a lot of like templates and a lot of things you can do. Again, Blender's great, Substance's great, a lot of great software. But yeah, that that should be, yeah, that's everything. <laughs> um, does anyone have any questions? So I didn't run through that too fast. I know I have a tendency of doing that. <laughs> if you need me to go back into anything, I'll be happy to. Yeah, um, I think, uh, Kathleen, I, I do wonder, um, oh, Jim is asking if you can put the tool screen back up. Um, yes. To talk through it. Um, yeah, if, if anyone have questions about AR and VR tools or uh, working as an AR VR designers and how to get into AR and VR, all, all of those things. Um, Maybe I can start with a, with one of my questions, and then I would love to um, hand it off to someone else. Uh, but Kathleen, uh, you know, I feel like, yeah, AR and VR is such a new field. And um, how, how did you even get into it? How, how did you find this uh, position and this field that you're working in? Well, um, 
I was in grad school at Savannah College of Art and Design in Savannah, Georgia, and uh, I was in a, cl a class called Media Theory. We all had our own like theory, and we had to create some sort of visual element to it. And uh, one of my friend's theories was, uh, I think he was Lev Manovich was the person that his theory, the person he was doing his theory on, and it was essentially like VR. And he borrowed an Oculus developer kit too at the time. So this is before the Oculus Rift which is the, the uh, PC connected Oculus headset um, was like finalized. So I saw that he did a project with it. I found out that the school had the tools to uh, develop VR content. And I'm like, I want to be a part of that. <laughs> and I just kind of literally just fell into it. Like as a kid, I was obsessed with future tech. I always saw like I was I love playing video games like N64 and all these like Nintendo games, but I always felt like VR was like the future in terms of gaming. Um, and fast forward <laughs> into grad school and finding out more about like Oculus uh, and the VR headsets and like want to be part of it, and it just kind of snowballed. Like after uh, d discovering we had that headset, I wanted to do my thesis on it which I think in that demo reel, there was a little cave environment that was a part of my thesis, which was a Sasquatch uh, animated story. <laughs> uh, and uh, I got into the Oculus Launchpad program, which is a three month developer program where you work on a essentially a demo VR project. So I was part of that. And then finishing grad school, started working in VR and as well as AR, did more, started doing AR I want to say when I started my first like after grad school job and then yeah and applied to I think it was the what was it Snapchat storytelling reticency and started doing a, a lot of filters after that this last year especially a lot of AR <laughs> a lot of AR last year um but yeah it just kind of snowballed I know that was a long story but long story short snowballed into found something I liked and just haven't looked back since. <laughs> That's awesome. So I'm going to feel some questions from, from everyone here. Um, so Jim has the question, you know, this tool screen that we have in front of us here, how well do your clients understand what you do? Like, how well do they understand my... Hmm. I guess like do they like how old do they understand like air filters for your content or the people that it, Jim, do you want to ask that questions if you are able to speak? Otherwise I can rephrase it myself. Jim is on mute. Yeah, I guess this um how, the question is how well do these clients understand what you do? Um when you are approach a, approaching a client, I know for me in, in uh, design and consulting, um, mm -hmm. you know, and Jim's, his experience working with most clients is that they don't really know what they need or know what they, what we do. Uh, and that can lead to confusing meetings. So um, how much of AR and VR and uh, do you have to explain to your client um, and how, how do you go about doing that? I guess like uh, when a client, this is like one of my earlier uh, jobs after grad school, we'd have a client that would want to do something like VR or AR related. And they would tell us what kind of like getting a general idea of like what they kind of want. And then uh, once they tell us that idea, we would uh, make suggestions based off of that, like what they're looking for and send back like, you know, especially for example, like uh, if someone wanted to do something with the metaverse, we would do like uh, kind of do get a research document and like summarize it into the options that they could do with that idea. Um, so essentially giving them like options, like a list of options and explaining it that way. But in terms of if someone didn't know virtual augmented reality, I would use examples for that people know already. For example, Pokemon Go is augmented reality. And I would use that as a way of saying, like, you you can see your environment, but the object is, like, three, augmented or 3D on, like, a phone. And in some cases, uh, glasses, 
with virtual reality, you are enclosed in your environment. And I just use examples that people are more familiar with. That way there is like some sort of context to what like they're thinking about. Um, so I guess virtual reality or like even, I might even use like a 360 video example, like maybe the YouTube 360 video examples as a semi virtual reality example um, where you're enclosed in a three-dimensional space. So yeah, just use examples that like you think people are most familiar with. For example, Snapchat. Snapchat has filters. Filters are augmented reality. Instagram has filters, also augmented reality. Um, and like maybe even show video examples too. Uh, Cause sometimes you can explain it, but some people might be more visual um, and finding like examples would be good. I hope that was a helpful question or answer, but yeah. Yeah, so essentially, um understanding what they're trying to solve and giving them doing a little bit of research um, and giving them examples of what's already out there as well mm -hmm. as options that you what you could potentially create for them yes yes awesome yeah jim great question keep keep on coming uh we've always intended this to be a qa um you know ama almost uh session so that uh because the field is evolving and I feel like Kathleen has a lot of um, early knowledge that we can all learn from. So Michael um, is asking, you know, all this tool, it, it can be a little bit overwhelming. So how, how would you recommend getting started in AR and VR? What would someone do to get their feet wet? Uh, I would start small. Like again, whatever project you're doing does not have to be some big elaborate thing. Um, I would use probably like even AR filters, like Lens Studio might be a good starting point for people like getting into like the AR side, because once you, Lens Studio and like maybe picking up 3D software like Blender, Blender's free, Lens Studio is free. Uh, and like going through like YouTube tutorials or tutorials online, like for example, Flipped Normals is a YouTube, uh, I guess station or whatever. Uh, that has a very good tutorial on like knowing how to use Blender. So I would start with like Blender and like getting familiar. If you're if you're more on the 2D background, getting familiar with the 3D space and thinking about the 3D space, even just spending a few days getting used to the navigation, like always start with like understanding, okay, how do I go about this in each software? Start small, start with understanding like how to use the tools um, and then maybe just it could even just be putting a cube uh, in like an AR space, just something small to see like, okay, I can do this. And um, it could be a small project like that. Um, yeah, Blender, Lens Studio. And if, and if you want like Unity is also a good uh, game engine to start with. It's, I would say it's a bit more complicated to learn compared to Lens Studio. Lens Studio is pretty straight to the point in terms of like AR, uh, like AR filter creation. Um, but yeah, University of YouTube is <laughs> still refer go to the University of YouTube and short YouTube as a kind of reference for trying to understand software. So just like understand software as well as just like look at, um, look at examples of virtual and augmented reality filters, even just spend time, uh, experiencing it, um, is a good, uh, starting point as well. Um, know what you're building for or know what you're, you want to build, but always start small. Again, it doesn't have to be a crazy elaborate thing. Um, like make, like basically do checkpoints where you're like, okay, I can build or I can at least model or whatever, or import in a model into Blender. And then I can export it into Lens Studio and I can maybe do like, you know, Lens Studio has templates too. So you can honestly plug in, even if you find a model and that might be helpful, just like finding like models and just putting it into Lens Studio and understanding just how to navigate Lens Studio will be good. Um, and starting from that, um, and Lens Studio also has a ton of great YouTube tutorials. Same thing with Spark, same thing with Unity and Unreal, and all these software. <laughs> yeah, uh, and Kathleen, yeah. feel free to, I feel like it would be really helpful for everyone to 
um, as you talk through things, just go to different URL. Um, I've been yeah. trying to put things in the chat as well, but um, Michael is asking the name of the YouTube channel that you recommend. I will share it in the chat. This is basic 3D. Um, let's see, flipped normals. normals. That is like a 3D YouTube station as well as Snapchat has their own um, Lens Studio stuff. Sorry, let me go through their playlist. Seems like Lens Studio is pretty, uh, it's a good start. For I love Lens Studio. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah it, it is great. Uh, I guess Lens Studio tutorials. And Michael, I know you raised your hand. So, um, you know, if you have any other questions, feel free to unmute yourself and ask. Um, there you go, Lens Studio. Um, we'll also go down the list again. So, um, Cool. So Sandy uh, is posing this question. Um, she, uh, Sandy's technical background, uh, they have technical background with system development and architecture, but um, they've never done any AR or VR. Um, can you maybe talk a little bit about how to create game assets? Game assets? Um, kind of like just build out in usually Blender and in some cases Cinema 40, the models um, and making sure like when you're built, when you're modeling out these assets, you want to, you don't want to like have a crazy poly count. I, I guess like you don't want it to be super, super like crazy heavy model. Um, trying to find an example of how to explain this, but um, keeping the poly count uh, fairly low. Um, and when you cut up the model, like when you're modeling something, you also want to cut it up into what is called a UV, which I would say it's kind of like, let's say you have a model of a bear and you need to add color onto the bear. In order to do that, you have to go through a process called UVing, which I would say is kind of like unwrapping the bear. Uh, think of it like unwrapping it like a bearskin rug. And with that bearskin rug layout, you would paint or apply textures onto that model. But with, I guess, this UV, let me see if I can, this might be easier if I just show. I don't know if you can see my screen, but let's see. Uh, yeah, hey, Kathleen, can you hear me? Yes. OK, thank you. Uh, yeah, this Sandy here. Uh, so it's just to, just to assist with my question, uh, so my question would be like, let's say uh, you're developing a, a, like even if not super fancy metaverse game, but like if you're doing a, you know, basic game with certain base game characters, uh, they could be, uh, uh, you know, they could be humanized or they could be just, uh, you know, basically any kind of mix uh, of, of human slash uh, uh, characters in there. And, and you're just trying to basically uh, uh, create those game assets. So that, let's say you're trying to do the, use those assets in Unity, for example, mm -hmm. right? Uh, how would you, like, how do you normally go about creating those assets? So let's say you're trying to basically create, like, say, four or five characters you're going to be playing in a game in Unity. And, and so this way you can basically uh, uh, use them as game assets who actually have other elements of game, like they have their collision factors, they have their other physics factors in the game mm -hmm. uh you can use them so so like you can't just take a you know character and drop that in unity you won't be able to use that so you need to assign some sort of contact points uh so that you can use them as a as a part of the physics and everything else over there correct yeah like when you're building an asset you would you know model it out in 3d software get it get the uv set up for well, as well as the process when you're building out a game it has to go through like a baking process so you want to make sure that UV is laid out correctly. Um, but essentially, you're building out the assets in a 3D software package like Blender, or you can, if you're doing a more character-based model, ZBrush, and then bring it over to Blender and reducing the poly count. Like you want to make sure your poly count is not super high because if you drop it into Unity, it's not. <laughs> it's gonna. <laughs> it's gonna cause a lot of problems, right. uh, as well as rigging in other 3D packages like Blender. You'd rig in Blender. You would animate in Blender, 
and you would reduce the poly count in Blender, then you would export uh, those assets into Unity. You can also, I know there's some websites where you can, if you're just looking for basic walk cycles or run cycles, uh, and I just lost the name of the website, but there's, <laughs> and it's owned by Adobe, Mixamo. Uh, Mixamo, you can plug in like a 3D model, and uh, in some cases it can rig a basic 2D, like a basic uh, character model and export those animations into your game. So I guess Mixamo, Mixamo also has pre-made asset, like pre-made characters too. Um, but yeah, I would basically spend time in the other software packages to build out the characters and then export it into Unity. And you're gonna have to be doing a lot of testing back and forth just to make sure certain things are working, certain textures are showing up. It's a lot of just kind of te testing out your assets. Um, Great, okay, thank you. Yeah. I'll put Mixamo in here because that's a good like if you don't have I'm, like I'm not really much of an animator so like uh, I would use so they have like character animations that you can use that are pre-made and put in and in some cases we'll kind of do like a really light rig for your character or armature underneath but I'll put this in the chat Mixamo I hope that was helpful and answered your question yeah of course Catherine thank you cool. thank you and again, yeah. um, my apologies because I'm kind of coming pretty baseline here, so so I, I don't want to take up too much time from everybody else. But uh -huh. uh, I'll I'll check these things out. Thanks so much. Anytime. Yeah. Yeah, and I'm I'm very um, thank you so much, Sandy, for for that question. It it uh, trigger kind of for me. I'm like, what is polycount? I I don't. Oh, know I'm sorry. Uh, so what is it? Polycount is kind of like so. I'm gonna just ooh, I'm gonna take this model. And... We're only seeing like a black screen, so you might oh. have to reshare. Oh, okay. Let me reshare. This is. Can you see my screen? Uh, yep. Okay. So I'm just gonna. This might look really messy. I'm gonna make sure that it is not. There's not a lot of stuff everywhere, and change the layout to modeling. So. All these little, like, I guess, um, what I'm click on here are called faces. And this is essentially like your polys. Polys are the faces in which your model is made up of. Uh, so this, this model is made up of faces to create like this 3D surface. And essentially, uh, you don't want a ton like of, uh, like millions and millions of these faces on there. You want to think of like N64 games. I know that's like an older example or like uh, older video games where they they don't look as like uh, realistic. I guess that's not a good, sorry. I was trying to think of an example, but um, uh, sorry. <laughs> um, I guess think of like uh, any like cell phone or other game or experience where it, it doesn't look like a PlayStation 5 or Xbox game where they're, it's super smooth all the time. Uh, it, you can see like visible like hard angles and whatnot. Um, so like those are made up of, I guess, a lower poly count. And I'm sorry, <laughs> um, I'm not giving, let me see if I can find a visual example. That might help. Poly count, poly count model. It's switch mm. screen again, Kathleen, because it's oh. Screen. oh, okay. Let me share <laughs> screen. All right, share. I'll just share the whole screen. Uh, so I guess this goal example, this is a, you can see there's so many like lines and uh, squares in this model. That is a very high poly model. There's a lot of multiple faces, millions of millions of faces uh, or square, like these little squares that it's made up of. And uh, it's reduced to, you see these, even though they're triangles or triangular in some aspects, uh, it's reduced to uh, less squares or triangles or faces, if you will. So you want to get your model from this to that um, to plug into 
I guess, for example, like AR, VR models. It doesn't have to be, again, each model you do will be unique. And maybe you don't have to reduce it to this much depending on what experience you're trying to build. Um, but yeah, for example, high poly, low poly. A lot of faces or squares, less squares and faces. I hope that, I hope that makes sense. Like you're reducing the amount of faces that the 3D model is made up of or the amount of squares that the model is made up of to less squares. So the software can read it and run it better and smoother. Basically, so you're not catching your computer on fire. I know it probably wouldn't literally catch on fire, but that's the mentality I have going into building a model. <laughs> so I hope that made sense. Yeah, super interesting. Thank you, Catherine. I'm gonna ask um, more questions from the audience here. Uh, so Lisa is asking, how does someone with creative assets approach hiring people or teams to create a presence on the various platforms? Um, Lisa, can okay. if you're in a place where you can speak, maybe yeah hi hi and <laughs> there you go <laughs> sure what did you want me to re, um restate it yes please in your own words okay well i was just thinking of how to get um a presence started the simplest way to do it and that concept of putting a square is really interesting especially if you you know replace it maybe with a few other things mm -hmm. but um it would be interesting to know like what's the simplest path to having a presence in all of the different places that you can have one for your I don't want to say brand like a product but like let's say you have characters or you know um, elements of a game uh, avatars or whatever and you want to have a place for them um, you know what would be the how would you go about doing that like what? how it, do you hire team managers and hire teams and get people working on each aspect of it or is there like a magic person who can <laughs> do this for everything or how do you approach it like if you're trying to build a team to make a uh, designated like hey I want to make have a team to make filters or I want to have a team to make characters or environments like that like a oh, well even more to have them a presence like for example I'll give you one example um uh decentralized community we have has a virtual town and it's in our imaginations. And so the thought of having it in virtual reality is very appealing, although daunting and overwhelming. So could we perhaps, you know, have like a community castle to start where we could gather in the various places? And that might be like, instead of the box, the one thing is the castle. But I'm just trying to think of um, simple ways. Perhaps you have other ideas, like what would you recommend to someone you know, who has, let's say a story with some concepts and some art and some characters and whatever, you know, how to put your toe in and get started hmm. without Excellent. building it yourself. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I guess I always think of like game jams as an example. Um, so when you're, today, today is actually the first day of global game jam, but uh, that is random, sorry. Uh, <laughs> but um, for example, I am, I want to make a game. I'll just use that as an example or an experience that is virtual reality. And um, I know I can build models, but I need someone to, I need a developer to be able to add like functionality or um, you want the user to do a specific thing or specific stuff. So I need to get a developer on the team as well as sound designers. Uh, audio is very important for any VR, AR thing. Um, and in some cases like product managers uh, and there might even be more of like a engineer to create tools for de the developer to, to do more with. Um, so I guess, I don't even know if that, that didn't really, but um, that sounds basically- like a lot of people. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah like especially for vr like it's it doesn't have to be like a huge team like it, it i guess it depends on what your budget is for that team and like you definitely want to have like a developer 
uh, you need an artist. Um, and in some cases, multiple artists. I know, for example, the team I'm on with Mend, we have uh, we have kind of like a consultant, uh, kind of, I guess, product manager, a director. We have three modelers. Uh, so I'm one of three. And then we have a sound designer. We have an engineer and the director of the project is a game designer. So he creates kind of like, he figures out, he figures out gameplay mechanics. Um, so that is kind of our team for Mend. Um, on some teams, it might be like four people. Maybe you have like a 3D person that can do, it's rare to find a art 3D artists to do more of like developing coding side, but they do exist. Maybe that person can do a little bit of both. Uh, and maybe that you have like a sound sound person and some sort of like management person and yeah so I guess it depends on the budget you have as well as yeah and the needs of like what the needs of your project maybe your project it needs a lot of models so you want to consider maybe having multiple 3d artists you might if you want to have more uh if you want to have like a certain amount of characters and certain amount of environments, you might want to consider hiring character artists who are specialized in just characters, as well as environment slash prop artists who are specialized in doing environment slash props, as well as animators and <laughs> riggers, which riggers essentially create the armature for uh, uh, the model, like a character model, for example, like I'll use Disney and uh, uh, Encanto, those characters have skeletons and animators have to move those characters so the rigor would essentially create a uh, skeleton for animators to move but 3d generalist uh kind of are a little bit of everything so i'm kind of a generalist i can do modeling a little bit of rigging <laughs> and like texturing or coloring in the model uh and a little bit of animation um, but it's not, I'm not a specialist with animation, um, kind of a jack of all trades. I guess the master of none is the term that people say <laughs> for generalists. So yeah, I guess I don't, budget and like the needs of the project are really what you want to think about. Um, like even making a list of what, okay, here's a project, here's what I need. And um, from there, I would like consider uh, thinking about who you need and it might even be good to have like a discord group too, or like any sort of like online group where you're like, hey, I have this project and um, I want to do this and maybe enlist online. Um, I know that might not be super helpful, but I always find like being in group settings or networking or talking to people, um, especially with game jams and stuff like that. Uh, that's how I found and recruited people <laughs> or I've been recruited, I guess, in this scenario. So hope that answered your question that's great thank you it, do you happen to have a list like this where it says software of all the places you mentioned you said it verbally i think but like instagram filters and the different places where we could use these assets yeah yeah uh i'll um uh, i can i can actually send the uh, yeah uh lens studio. Oh, be amazing thank you so much anytime lens studio Sorry, I'm just going to pull up and send the link out. I might send you, I'll probably send you a document too, so you can send out if you, uh, as well. Uh, Lens good. Studio, that is that, that is a really long link. I, I hope that's set to the right thing. That did. Okay. Uh, <laughs> Spark AR, and those are free. Uh, Blender is amazing. I'm still surprised that is free software. Uh, it is amazing 3D package, uh, and it's free. Uh, <laughs> Blender software, this uh, Blender, I'm gonna copy that in there. Um, Spark AR, Unity is also free and Unreal is also free, but I think if you start to build, let's say you're just building a AAA game or a very big game, then that there's money that's involved, but Unity, uh, Unity. A lot of links right. coming through, that's great. Yeah, yeah, Unity and Unreal, Unreal Engine, and I feel like I'm forgetting. 
something. Oh, Substance. If you have Adobe Creative Suite, I think there is like another package for Substance now. Adobe Substance 3D. And I know Adobe's working on 3D software. It's just in a beta phase right now, which I think once it's out, it looks like it will be an amazing tool, but it's it's still beta. Um, yeah. Where else can you use the assets? Like where else can you use 3D assets? Yeah. You could print them out. Like some people make 3D models to print. Um, you can use them. I guess how you build the assets. So for example, if you're 3D printing a model, it poly count doesn't really matter. It's more so making sure what browser thing we're using. Oh, I'm using Brave. Um, someone told me about it. I'm like, oh, I'm just going to switch from Chrome to Brave. Um, Okay. Oh, yeah. Sorry. Uh, ADD brain. <laughs> uh, yeah. So with 3D printing, the poly count doesn't really matter, but for AR or uh, more mobile experiences, you want to have lower density, mesh density, lower faces or poly count. Uh, so it depends on how you build out the models and gearing it towards different experiences. Um, but as terms of 3D assets in general, it can be used for multiple use case scenarios. So I hope that helped too. <laughs> yeah. Yes, thanks. That's awesome. We have more questions. <laughs> That's great. Um, so very quickly, um, thank you for filling these questions, um, Kathleen. Jim is asking, how much do people expect spatial sound and how sophisticated do we think we need to make our sound design? Um, so, yeah, I'm not, so, I'm, I'm not a sound designer, but I definitely think uh, with sound, it might be good to have a sound designer as well as a composer. Uh, so the sound designer would create, you know, if someone needs to, if you're stepping in the space, like for example, virtual reality, you need to like, you know, you want to have sound to have each footstep, or if you're like picking up something, you want the sound of like what that rock is. Um, I know with spatial audio and I guess Half-Life Alex, which is a VR game, they have a sound kit and let me see if I can remember <laughs> what that was, but it was more of a spatial audio system where you can apply a sound to certain like three-dimensional space. Uh, but yeah, sound is highly important for any immersive experience you're doing, even if it's just like, you know, a composed sound, like, like a composed and more environmental sound, like maybe, maybe it, the, there's an experience where it's nighttime and the sun comes out and you have more of like a nighttime theme. I'm going to just use Hedwig's theme from Harry Potter. That's the first thing that came to mind for whatever reason. It's always Harry Potter for some reason with me <laughs> in referencing <laughs> immersive stuff. But um, Hedwig's theme comes um, comes at, in at night. And then I guess in the morning, it might be a small world after all theme. I know those are two very random examples, but you want like some sort of interesting auditorial environmental soundtrack or score. But uh, let me see if I can find that Half-Life Alex uh, Valve's um, audio tools, Half-Life audio tool. Uh, I don't. Yeah, and, and okay. I think Jim was uh, mentoning the question of what's the skill range of jams and how good do you need it to be to show up? Oh, game jams? Anyone can show up. Uh, like, yeah, you, you can have no experience or a lot of experience. Uh, game jams are a great way to get your feet wet and meet people and networking as well. Because, I mean, heck, the first game jam I went to in Memphis, uh, I met people that I end up working with. For example, Mend. I met the people I worked with on Mend through game jam. Um, and now we work together, so... <laughs> Uh, it's a great thing to be a part of. Um, okay, I, I will have to find this. I can't remember what the software they use, but I when I find it, I will I will send it to you. Um, oh, 
That's awesome. Sorry. Yeah. Two, two dots in the background. I was just going to say, I also went to Game Jam and I'm not a game designer by any mean. I'm, I'm a UX designer. So whatever skill set that you have, um, even if you're, you know, only concepting, they, they love it. Uh, and the theme this year, uh, Car- Kathleen and I were talking about it is uh, duality, right, Kathleen? Yep duality uh and that's an open-ended theme like and with game jams it doesn't even have to be like a vr ar or video game i'm doing a board game (laughs) uh which i'm probably gonna take into ar but i'm doing a board game this year and it can really be any game that you can think of and the theme is open-ended so i mean there's a theme but that interpretation is open-ended that's pretty cool. Uh, Michael is asking what awesome browser theme you are using. Oh, I'm using Brave. I put the link for Brave oh, in the chat. And I also put the link for Global Game Chan in the chat as well. Uh, and I think there's a bunch of other links if people like have, I'll, I'll, I'll definitely send you all this stuff too, just in case. Oh, okay. Uh, yeah. Yeah, awesome. Thank you. I just want to make sure all of the questions and answers. Uh, D and D using AR might be a great idea. Jascha is saying, "Yeah, there is. Uh, uh, she used to work for Valve, and she does now Tilt Tilt Five, which is an AR um, AR headset slash uh, hardware that is very um, much uh, tabletop focused." actually randomly met her at some networking event and I just talked to her about D&D and finding out she did this really awesome headset that, yeah, um, her name is Jerry Lewis, and, or Jerry, yeah, and, uh, but yeah, AR is a cool gaming tool. Uh, sorry, <laughs> that's, I put the link to Tilt 5 if anyone was curious about that. That's awesome. So, Karen you're saying that you try to put all of these tools into one doc and we can share it out. Um, yes, I, everyone. yes, I will put it all into a doc. Uh, I'll also ask some of my sound design friends like links for, for that because I'm not a sound designer. So I, I don't know like off the top of my head like how to go about that process. I just know it's very important for any immersive experience you need. Like always think about sound. Don't see, as a, see it as an afterthought. Um, that's awesome. Anyone else? We have about 10 minutes left. Anyone else have any other questions? Uh, we have a deep well of knowledge here. So go for it. Um, Kathleen, what, what do you, when you're working on your day to day, as people are thinking about questions, I will have one. Um, as an AR VR designer, what are you? What are you most excited about? What are you, what are you looking forward to thinking ahead in this, this field? I guess it's always the problem solving that's fun. Um, like figuring out interesting ways to tell a story um, or an experience is always like the thing I look forward to uh, as well as since I create more of the assets for AR and VR, making those assets and bringing that vision to life um, but I like it because it's still a pl- in a playground phase. There's still, um, th- there's still like not a whole lot of rules, I guess still, but, um, it, it's, I don't know, it's like a sandbox it, and a puzzle at the same time, you are constantly learning, <laughs> you're constantly problem solving <laughs> and, uh, and just thinking of really interesting ways to tell a story in a way I kind of feel like a kid, like you're making Legos and you're experiencing those Legos. Uh, I know I said Harry Potter is an example, going to the Wizarding World uh, in person was a very uh, great reference for me for VR, uh, going to, I think it was Diagon Alley in Orlando and casting spells, like taking real world examples of immersive experience like theme parks, or maybe you went to a playground. Those are great like references, just everyday experiences that maybe had a powerful impact on you. Like there's always something to learn from just your day-to-day experience. Um, 
and you're constantly going to be learning. <laughs> it doesn't stop. And then software and hardware update. So <laughs> constantly learning, <laughs> but it's exciting and it's always something new. Um, so that's awesome. Well, on that note, um, amazing. Thank you so much for sharing all of your knowledge and, and real examples. Uh, that's, that's very cool. Um, so yeah, I'll check in with you once you're in a good place to put all this tool together in a, in a doc and we can share it back with, with our audience here. Oh, yeah. Awesome. Thank you. Oh, Thank you. Yeah. yeah, I'm going to, yeah, heart. I, I could probably emote, but I think this is fun too. So. <laughs> That's awesome. Yeah, thank you all for joining and uh, have a good rest of your week and a weekend ahead. Yeah. Yeah. And, and happy Thor's Day. I always like using Norse mythology for the days of the week. So, <laughs> Thor's Day. Yesterday was Odin's Day. Yep. Uh, or Woden's Day. Yeah. <laughs> nerds helping nerds. Yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and I think tomorrow is Freya's Day. Uh, Friday. Um, I, I also drop um, Kathleen's LinkedIn. Um, I'll put it on here again. Uh, Michael is asking if we can link uh, to yeah. LinkedIn. Yeah, and if you have any questions, you can. I, I'm pretty active on LinkedIn, so I'll see your message right away or email. I'm active on my emails, so yeah. I know that's like really old school, but I don't know. <laughs> Google. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and this is our collective as well. Um, come check us out. We, we do this kind of workshop in or AMA about, um, you know, we try to do it at least once a month, maybe more. Um, so hopefully uh, we'll see you again. I think our March uh, design uh, workshop will be on game design, uh, UX and game design. So uh, if you are interested in that, um, I'm going to drop a link, yet another link. <laughs> Uh, just make sure that you are signed up on Eventbrite and um, put your email here so we can, we can send you when that event is up. But anyway, uh, thank you so much, Kathleen, uh, for being here. Thank you, everyone. Um, hope everyone has a nice night or day. Day, night, what is it? Time. It, it's, it's time. It seems weird now. So. <laughs> Whatever. <laughs> Yeah. yeah, what is it? <laughs> okay, have a good one, everyone.